Hi, everybody. How are you? You're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Fitzpatrick. I am one of the co-directors of AME, alongside Alice Butler. And we're delighted to be hosting this uh, film funding information clinic. We're going to start by hearing from Fanil Sweeney. He's going to talk you through um, a lot of information about uh, film funding. And yeah, and then just in the second session, a little bit, we'll be talking in hopefully like quite a bit of detail to with Tycho Sullivan. And um, that conversation is also going to be like um, very focused on like the role funding has played uh, for Tyg and in his career as a film artist um, and we'll be really kind of mining him for useful information so I would like you know I think that'll be a very useful session um, and we're, we're both really looking forward to it hmm. um, yeah what, uh, what else do we I mean nothing else too major other than to say that um, we at Amy regularly organize these kinds of events that offer information about supporting your practice as uh, artist filmmakers so um, if you haven't already, uh, try and follow us on social media if you're on that, or you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the um, uh, homepage of our website, and that highlights opportunities around funding, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, festival submission dates, um, as well as kind of events and exhibitions and screenings taking place right across the country. Not, we don't just sort of highlight our own events. Um, so we'd really encourage you just to sort of keep an eye on what we're doing if you're interested in attending more of these events in these kinds of events in the future. Yeah. I yeah, that's, that's it. I'll just hand over to Fanula. And thanks so much to everyone for coming and to the Arts Council and Ty mm -hmm. <laughs> in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Great to see so many of you here today um, on such a lovely, cold, bright, frosty morning. And great to see so many new faces amongst you as well. Um, I'm here with a few colleagues today from the Arts Council, Audrey Keane, Steffi Kelly, and the Arts Council's film advisor, Moretta Dillon. So hopefully we'll get a chance to meet you and chat to you more informally over lunch. But I'm going to kind of speed through what it is the Arts Council does in film, give you an overall context for what it is we do in the area of film, and then focus on the awards we offer to film artists. And then Audrey will go through some top tips in making applications to the Arts Council and making film applications to the Arts Council. So we're hoping to get through this pretty quickly to give you kind of key information, but to be able then to take questions from you, which is probably the most valuable part of the session. So I will kick off by telling you what it is the Arts Council does in the area of film. And I think it's worth keeping in mind this, what we do, what we're concerned about in everything we do in film is film as an art form. It's the art of film. So... We support film as an art form and we're central to the provision of a national infrastructure for film culture in Ireland. We support film artists and we provide for and develop public engagement with cultural cinema. In this way, we serve both artists and the public. So our role in film is a discrete one that's distinct from but complementary to the role of Screen Ireland, which works to develop the Irish film industry, and our work also complements the roles of RTE, of TG Cahar and the BAI in the area of television production, and it aligns with the Creative Ireland programme. We have a film policy in place which flows from our 10-year strategy, Making Great Artwork. This reaffirms and prioritises the Arts Council's commitment to film artists and to public engagement in the area of film. All of the Arts Council's activities, including our film awards, are informed by our, our equality, human rights and diversity policy and our paying the artist policy. So that is something we might come back to later as well. So if we talk about what um, and how we support film artists, we offer film awards directly to artists. And these are designed to provide artists with an opportunity to develop their practice, and an award that offers that is the film bursary, for example, to make work of an experimental or non-narrative nature, the film project award, 
or to make artist-led authored work and our Real Art Arts Documentary Scheme and our authored works uh, feature award offer opportunities for that. And we'll go into these awards in more detail later. This is just to give you an overview. So they're all film awards. Those awards I've just spoken about are within the film team. They're very much designed purely for film artists. Then we have cross art form awards, which apply across all art forms. The Next Generation Bursary, the Markovich Award, the Agility Award and Open Call. And the difference between the let's say the film awards and these cross art form awards is in the film awards, you're competing with other film artists. In the cross art form awards, you're competing with artists in other areas. So it's just worth bearing that in mind as we go through things this morning. We also um, work in partnership with others to provide enhanced opportunities for artists. So in that regard, we work with TG Cahar on a scheme called Ildana, which um, supports the making of documentaries on the arts in Irish. And we work with UCC on our Film Artist in Residence scheme. And then we support artists indirectly through the um, funding we provide to um, film organisations, those film organisations that together form what we would describe as the national infrastructure for film culture. So they are the Irish Film Institute, of course, Access Cinema, Amy, who's here today, strategic film festivals, and by that we mean the three key and core film festivals, the Dublin International Film Festival, the Cork International Film Festival, and the Galway Film Fla. Then smaller film festivals throughout the country, such as Fastnet, Offline, Catalyst, and others. And then arts centres that offer film programmes throughout the country. So these organisations all provide exhibition platforms and creative development opportunities for artists. In terms of public engagement, we support the development of audiences for cultural cinema, through our funding, again, of a range of film programming organisations, and they tend to be the same organisations, the Irish Film Institute, Access Cinema, AMI, the key film festivals, and art centres. So it's through the work of these organisations that we enable the public to access a diverse range of cinema and to be given the opportunity to critically engage with film culture and to have, you know, proper discourse about film. But we also work with the organisations we fund to provide support to film artists and new opportunities for the exhibition of their work to audiences. So, for example, in our funding of AMI and our, we, our partnerships with DIFF, that's the exhibition of the real art um, films and the IFI with authored works. We also provide more opportunities for critical discourse on film and film culture through those um, various initiatives. But you're here today really to find out about the awards we offer to artists. As I described earlier, we have the direct film awards and then the cross art form awards. So we'll go through the film awards first and then move on to the more generic cross art form ones. So the film bursary, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the bursary award. Um, in film, it's the film bursary is to support film artists whose practice is in the field of experimental and non-narrative film work. It provides artists with the time and resources to think, to research, to reflect and to engage with their practice. It is not a production award. If you apply to make a film under this award, you won't be funded. It is not a production award. So it's proposals um, that enable artists to develop ideas about their practice or to consolidate their practice. It's really an award that enables an artist to take time out to be an artist, you know, to take time away from other things they might be doing. In the last year or two, um, or the last couple of rounds of this award, it was stranded in so far as you had to apply for certain amounts of money. Now you don't. You can apply for any amount of money that you think you need um, to do what it is you want to do under this award any amount between five and 20,000. In film, there is one round of this award annually and it's coming up on Thursday, the 9th of February. And then it 
will be offered again in February of next year. The Film Project Award, this is a production award. There are two strands to it, which we'll get, get into in a second. But it supports the making of high quality, creatively ambitious film work of an experimental nature. The work needs to be filmic. It needs to engage and challenge audiences. It needs to be made for cinema in the first instance. So experimental in former content and non-narrative in structure. And successfully completed um, projects under the Film Project Award can then, when completed, come back in for exhibition support through another process. So they qualify to come in for that. So this year we are introducing a new strand to the Film Project Award, and that is a research and development strand. We're offering up to €7,000 for that so that um, applicants can research and develop ideas that could be developed into a production, a strand two production project. So into a, prop, you know, a full project award. So basically it's for ideas for projects that would be eligible to apply under strand two. And if you get strand one in one year, you can apply for strand two to make that work in a, sec in a subsequent year. And then strand two is the project as always was, the production strand, and we are offering up to 80,000 now in that strand. There are two deadlines for that award this year, Thursday 23rd of March and Thursday the 16th of November. But there will only be one deadline next year and that will be in November 24. So if you have an idea for a project award that you want to make, this year or next, you need to be applying in March of this year or in November of this year, because there will be then 12 months before it is offered again. The budget will remain the same, but it'll just be one round rather than two. So real art, I think there are a couple of people in the room who've made real arts. Um, this provides artists again with the creative and editorial freedom to make highly creative, imaginative and experimental documentaries on an artistic theme for cinema. We support, hopefully two films we'll be able to support in 2023, as we have done before. There's one round annually, and the deadline this year is on the 8th of June. We've increased the budget in this area as well. So it, is, it now stands at 120,000 to make the work. And on completion, a further 15 can be applied for to support the exhibition of that work to support the artist to bring that work to audiences. And films that, um, with real art, films must be made for the available budget. It's discreet. You must come in and make the film you want to make for that funding. So there, it doesn't allow for you to go off and spend time looking for other funding. So we're just looking for ideas for work that can be made within that budget. And then the films made under the scheme must be completed to premiere at the Dublin International Film Festival in 2025. Most, if not all, real art films that have been made since, I think, 2008-9 was the first year we supported films under real art. Most, if not all of them, are available on the IFI player. And anyone interested in applying for real art should become familiar with the type of work that has been supported under the scheme and access the films there. We'll have two films premiering at this year's Dublin Film Festival, one by Cara Holmes and one by jo Michael John Whelan. And again, I would strongly recommend people see those films in situ um, at the film festival if you're interested in um, making an application this year. We introduced um, Authored Works, it must be maybe six years ago, four, five, six years ago now, um, because we felt there was a gap in the area of film that needed to be filled. And the idea of Authored Works is to provide film artists in the same way as Real Art, to provide film artists with creative and editorial freedom, but this time to make feature length, artistically authored film. And we're not saying what that needs to be. It's wide open. We'll support one film in 2023. Again, the deadline is the 8th of June. The fund, again, we've increased the production budget. So the production budget will now stand at 230,000. And on completion, 
is eligible to apply for exhibition support of 17,500, again, to enable the film to reach audiences. Like real art, films must be made for that total budget of um, 230,000, and they must be completed by the end of 2025. The artists who've made work under that scheme include Tygo Sullivan. I think, Tyg, you've been supported under all the various schemes. <laughs> but you've made one of the, um, the authored works as well. Ildana then is a scheme we offer with TG Cahar. And the idea is really to enhance the TG Cahar schedule outside of regular commissioning. And we're looking for ambitious and cinematic long form documentaries on the arts in Irish. It's jointly funded by the Arts Council and TG Cahar and work funded under it, unusually for television, has a theatrical window built in. TD Carr are really happy for the work to get out there in cinemas before they screen it, which is fantastic. And then they broadcast it to a primetime TD Carr audience. The fund that's available for that, again, has been increased, and it's 135000 per project. Films you may be aware of made under that are Eo Collion's Comer, Paula Kyo's Hiroshima Mariyal and Kieran Cormick's was the most recent. That's Ashley Trinale of that was um, the film about their new grief uh, that was recently um, exhibited. The date and the detail of the next round are to be confirmed, but it'll probably be mid-2023. And details of all of these funding rounds are made available in our newsletter and on the website. So when, it, when it's decided, it'll be, um, the information will be quickly made available. And then we offer a film artist in residence at UCC. And this offers artists a unique opportunity to develop their film practice in a university environment. The appointment is for one year and the successful applicant is paid a fee of 30,000 euro. I think the way to look at this is like a super bursary. When we say it's for a full year, the artist is required to spend one semester in the university, but the rest of the time is their own. And they're required to spend, I think, four hours a week in that semester, have four contact hours a week with students. And that's all decided. How that, what form that should take is decided between the artist and UCC. And you can see various previous recipients of that award. Again, Thai features. <laughs> and yeah. Maximilian Lecan is the current film artist there. And he's actually giving public talks as film artist in residence. I think they're coming up in February, Steffi, is it? Yeah. So it's worth looking at that. Arts grant funding. This is an award. I'm just going to talk about it very briefly because it's an award that's while it's open to individuals and organisations, it tends to be, certainly in the area of film, an award that's more suited to organisations because it's designed to support more than one distinct arts activity or provide supports or facilities to artists. So Amy's funded under, under it because Amy's providing supports and facilities to artists and more than one activity through the range of work it does in offering advice and information to artists, supporting the exhibition of their work and all the rest. So I think in the area of film, it's not quite suited to artists, but if somebody comes up with it, an, an artist comes up with an idea to offer a programme of more than one distinct art activity that supports or facilitates artists, they can apply. So its focus is to deliver outcomes that develop the arts, generating high quality experiences for the public and providing excellent services, resources or facilities that support the work of artists or the art sector. That's where Amy would fit in in terms of funding. So the amount is unlimited. There can be very small amounts um, offered under the award um, to quite large ones. And the deadline for that is the 11th of May. This is an award that's offered across the board within the Arts Council. So the Agility Award then, if we come on to the Agility, this is a cross art form award. It's a new award that was developed during COVID. It's intended to be a light touch award. It's open and flexible, designed around the needs of professional artists and arts workers. 
and priority in it is given to applications that demonstrate how the artists or arts workers practice will benefit from taking time to develop their practice or artistic ideas. In film, applications must fit within the context of the Arts Council's role and remit in film in the same way as any anyone applying for any other Arts Council award in film. So that is something to bear in mind. We won't be supporting something for broadcast television. We won't be supporting something that could be, would be more appropriately funded, let's say by Screen Ireland. They have their, Screen Ireland has its role, we have ours, and our role in film is to support artists to make, as we've said before, experimental, non-narrative non or artistically, strongly artistically authored work. So the amounts you can apply for in that are 1,500 to 5,000 and the deadline is Thursday the 9th of February and a later deadline of Thursday the 22nd of June. You'll have noticed all our deadlines are at 17.30 on Thursdays. It is an award. If you haven't been funded by the Arts Council before, this is the award you should probably think about in the first instance depending on what it is you want to do, obviously, but it, it's worth putting your toe in the water with this one. The Markovich Award is an award that the Arts Council offers on behalf of the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, the Gael Clux. It was established by the Department to honour Constance de Markovich um, in the context of the Decade of Centenaries. It's intended to provide support for artists from all backgrounds and genres, so cross our form, to buy time and space in order to develop new work, but the work must reflect on the role of women in the period covered by the decade of centenaries, 2012 to 2023 and beyond. So unless you've got an idea related to that, this isn't the award for you. It's important to note that one of the awards each year is assigned to an artist working in the Gaelic and or through the medium of Irish. There's one round annually and the deadline is Thursday the 16th of February. It's worth bearing in mind as well, only 10 awards are made across all the various art form areas. So it's very competitive in that regard. The Next Generation Award, again, this is another kind of, I suppose, super bursary type award. It supports promising artists, again, across all disciplines. And this is key at an early but pivotal stage in their career. You have to demonstrate in your application why at this point you should be supported for a next generation award, let's say over a bursary. You need to make that distinction in your application. So it supports the buying of time, very much like a bursary, and for an artist to develop their work and practice and to support unique development needs to advance their practice. 25,000 is the amount that is offered and successful applicants must take part in a week-long residential programme at the Tyrone Guthrie Centre with the other Next Generation Award recipients. So it's a lovely way of bringing artists together at a pivotal stage in their careers. And great artist collaborations have grown out of it over the years because of that. And again, I think it's you know, 18 awards across all art forms. So again, very competitive. One round annually, 17.30 on the 13th of April. This year, and I think it's worth noting, you can only apply for one of the bursary type of awards. So you need to really think hard if you want to make an application for Agility, Bursary, Markovich and Next Generation. Which of those you're best suited to at this point because you can only apply for one of them. Just bear that in mind before you make the application. I haven't said anything about the Open Call Award because we're not sure if that is running this year and if it is, how and when. Detail on that will be forthcoming if it is. It's a, it's a generic high-level award that artists and organisations can apply for. But as I say, I'm not sure if it's been offered. So I'm going to ask Audrey maybe to go through some top tips for making applications that will hopefully be useful. And then we'll both take questions afterwards. OK. Thank you. Hi. 
Thanks, Nuala. I'm I'm actually not going to speak for very long at all, really. I have a couple of notes, just a few things that I wanted to flag, and it's particularly, I suppose, for people who may not be familiar with applying to the Arts Council. I suppose there's some common mistakes and things that we pick up on from um, new applicants, so I just wanted to highlight them. So the first, first thing is, if you haven't applied to the Arts Council before, you need to have an online services account in order to submit an application. And it can take up to five working days to set that up. Nuala's given you all the deadlines there. People think they've got plenty of time and then all of a sudden the deadline is here. Um, If you apply for an account um, and you don't have your number, it may have gone into your spam folder because it's an automatically generated thing. So... If you have any issues like that, just make sure that you've allowed yourself enough time. Steffi and I are always at the end of the phone and email um, for any issues. And there's an online services email as well for, for technical things. So that's the first thing, I suppose. Make sure you apply in time to get your account. One of the key things in your application is mandatory supporting material. Um, There's always a list on the guidelines, depending on the award for the different types of things that you need to include, including things like CVs or examples of your your phone clips. If something is mandatory and you either forget to upload it or it doesn't upload properly, unfortunately, um, your application will be made ineligible. So we always just encourage um, people to check and make sure that everything that you have is included in your application and make sure that it's uploaded correctly because sometimes people think they've uploaded something and then unfortunately it turns out that maybe it didn't upload the the 5 30 on a thursday deadline uh, what happens actually is the system actually shuts down and if you discover even at 5.35, unfortunately, that something hasn't uploaded correctly. There is no opportunity to do anything and you have to wait for the next round. And unfortunately, sometimes that can be a year. So just give yourself plenty of time and make sure that everything that you should have in your application is kind of present and correct on our system before the deadline. And we would always say, don't leave it till the day of the deadline. (laughs) You know, just do it maybe 24 to 48 hours beforehand. And it means then that if you have particularly any technical issues, that you've got time to contact our IT people. They get very busy, particularly the day of the deadline and particularly the afternoon. You know, you'll give yourself the best chance if you just give yourself that time. And I know it's hard. We all tend to leave things till the last minute sometimes. Um, Then when it comes to examples of your film clips, something we occasionally find as well is people upload their kind of key film clips that are critical to the application, but sometimes they're password protected and they forget to give us the passwords. So if there's any film clips that need a password, just again, just make sure that you give us that because otherwise people assessing the application won't be able to see your work and it is a key part of the assessment. Another minor thing, I think, but it comes up in film more than the other art forms, is so if you apply in your name and then you're awarded funding, if you have your own film production company and it turns out that you actually want the funds to be paid into a bank account in the name of your film production company, we have an issue with that because the funding is awarded to the name on the application. So just think ahead and if you think you want the funds to go into a company name, then apply in your production company name um, instead. Fanula mentioned the newsletter. You can sign up to the newsletter on our website and it is a good way of just, you know, keeping on top of when the deadlines are coming up because everything's advertised about six weeks or at least four weeks before that. And then that's it really. Just the main thing to say is sometimes people ring us up and they're apologising for ringing us and asking us questions, but that's what we're there for. So, you know, if you're not sure about something, you're always very welcome to phone or email myself and Steffi with any question that you have. That's it. Thanks. The, The word experimental being mentioned several times and through the bursaries. Um, Could you expand a bit on what you mean by experimental and what the boundaries of experimental employ, please? There aren't any boundaries. Um, And I'm not going to give you a definition of experimental. 
But I am going to say, look at the work we have supported. You know, what we mean is work that is not mainstream and work that wouldn't be funded by another funding body. Is that okay? Because anyone will, you know, if we give a definition, we'd be digging a hole for ourselves. So, you know, what's experimental? Yeah, just, I'll, I'll leave it at that, if that's all right. <laughs> Look at the work we funded. It's all published. All the recipients of our awards in any scheme, you know, we pu we, we're a public body. We publish who we fund. Details of them are on our website. Yeah, yeah okay. Audrey. In the funding section of the website, if there's a drop down and there's a who we have, who we funded, and you can do a search for film projects, film bursary, whatever, and a list will come up. You know, you do it by year. How many real arts were given out per year? Um, when we introduced real art in, as I say, I think it was 2009, I think. Um, we were able to fund three at that stage and then with the contraction in um, funding a few years later, we were only able to support two and we supported two every year since. And actually, that's about right in terms of the, the ones that are coming through. It's, it is very competitive, but we support two and they're always premier at the Dublin International Film Festival. They're our exhibition partner on the scheme. Our hope this year is that we'd be able to support two. We'd definitely be able to support one. And before the deadline, we'll know whether we'd be able to do more than one. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there, a, is there a particular loading given to previous recipients of bursaries? Abs no, absolutely not. Everything is um, competitive within any particular round. What you will find is, though, that people... Some people are really good at making applications. Some people go to Amy and find out what it is they need to do and get advice about making an application. That advice is really worth taking. If you haven't been funded before, I'd advise you do go to Amy and get advice on making an Arts Council application. And as Audrey says, you know, the film team is happy to talk, but we can't talk in advance about what it is you might be coming to do because we keep a level playing field um, and we can talk to you, tech, uh, you know, about broad issues and technical issues, but not about your application, whereas Amy are able to do that and provide advice. The other thing I would just add to that is just to speak to people, any form of funding you're going for, speak to other artists that have gone for that funding and been successful and generally our experience, artists are very, like, open to, like, having those conversations. So, you know, do the bit of research, find out who is like gotten funding and reach out to people that they tend to be quite generous. And it's why Thaig is here this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, and just to add, if for anyone who's not aware, we do run artist support sessions at yeah. Amy. So if you contact us and you'd like to share, or would like to ask questions about making an application or anything like that, uh, you just contact us uh, at our info address and we could set that up for you. So we just have like a formal structure around how we support artists and those sessions are available to anybody at any stage of practice. So at any stage, just like reach out to us. So sometimes there can be, we can be busy with them, but we'll, we'll certainly get to you. Yeah. Can I just add, what, sorry, I was just going to add one thing there actually, because I'm just reading my own slide now and realise there was something... Um, if you've applied for funding and you, oh, yeah. well, actually, whether you were successful or unsuccessful, you can always come back to us and we would encourage you to come back and ask for feedback. Um, and in that case, you will get the assessment of your application, which, you know, there can be a good learning in that so that you can see where the strengths and weaknesses of your application was. And it'll also tell you whether you were shortlisted or not and, you know, um, if you were shortlisted and it goes to a panel, there'll be a comment from the panel. So, so always ask for, for your feedback. Yeah. Hi, um, I have two questions, if I may. Um, I, I want to just clarify, you said you can only apply for one bursary per one. year? Um, yes, you, um, I'm one bursary type award this year. Um, so that is, you can only apply for an agility award or a bursary award, or a Markovich award, or a Next Generation award. That's a new thing that's come in corporately across the Arts Council this year. Yeah. 
Okay, brilliant. And if you do apply for one of those, can you also say apply for real arts? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. It's just the bursary style awards and it's it's made clear in the guidelines for those awards, which, you know, um, it'll say and real art won't have if you've applied for you can't apply. You know, you. You, okay. you can apply for a production award, let's say, like a project award or a real art or an Orsford Works or an Ildana. Yes, you can. OK, thank you. And you can actually even apply for the Film Artists in Residence. Yeah, it's just the generic mm -hmm. awards. Yeah, first three Brilliant. Times. And uh, the second th question, um, do you or have you funded, uh, is it for Irish citizens or also Irish residents? It's, do you fund both? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, residents in Ireland, resident in Ireland or Irish, yeah, citizens, yeah. Hi, yeah. Just a quick question, I'm sorry if this is too specific, but I just noticed in the film Bursary Award, it advises you not to say or that you don't support workshops with actors. Um, but what if your, I don't know, what if your practice is very much based around... Uh, performers or actors and non-actors and you want to do like screen tests or just mess around with a camera and an actor is there any way to do that or are you better off just not telling not telling us <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I just realized i mid-sentence shut up <laughs> yeah <laughs> no i mean it's you know the idea is it's not designed to support um, that. I think that came in because there was a period many years ago when we were getting just applications for that. And it was like, what? You know, there's another agency that supports people um, in, you know, developing work in that way and stuff. So, yeah. So, Ty. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a question. Uh, oh, a question. Um, just because what has changed uh, is that the research and development strand of the project award. That's, that's a big, right. That's a big change. And my question is, does that affect the bursary and the project award application in any way? No, no, you can apply for a bursary or an agility award or a Markovich award or an X generation award and apply for round one of strand one of the project award to research and develop a project because that is very particular you know the other is about your overall general practice as an artist whereas the strand one the research and development strand of the project award is you doing research and development for a particular project and if you needed to do some art actor workshops you know you could do them in that but i suppose the reason i ask is that yeah. anytime i've written a bursary successful or, or otherwise I know you're not developing a project necessarily, mm. but you tend to mention this mm. is the broad subject that mm. I'll be working in, which is kind of alluding to a potential project down the line. Is the accent now moving away from that in terms of... No, no, you can do that with a bursary. Nothing's changed with bursary at all. Nothing's changed. But we're ha we have now just introduced the purely research and development strand to the project award. You couldn't apply for the same thing under both. You couldn't do that because you can't ever do that with the Arts Council. You, you've one bite of the cherry, you know, and as Audrey said, and you need to make your application the best it can be. We don't, because we get so many applications across every art form, we can't keep assessing the same application. So you need to come in with um, an application that's the best it can be and you're giving its best shot. But sorry, I'm going off track there. But you can... Under the, the research and development of the project award, it's intended for you to be purely about that project. But if, yeah, but you shouldn't have got a bursary for that project, you know, where you were developing that or ideas for that before. So you need to make, in making an application, you'd need to decide where, where best that would fit. If it's broad, bursary. If it's very particular, I'd say project. We're trying it out. It's new. We hope it'll work. We think there's a need for it. So we'll find out over the next couple of years. Can I ask one more follow-up? Yeah. That? Just if someone got the research and development for the project, mm. that application ended up for authored works. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You know, that could it's also a, yeah, be, because it could yeah. become bigger through the yeah. process. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 Sorry, can you say that again? 
So if somebody, for example, applied for the research and development for a film project award, but the application ended up going in for authored works, maybe the, the project becomes bigger or something like that, you know, it's, the authored works is a very large application. It's the kind of application that could also really benefit from that sort of research and development process. So I just wondered if there were applicable or cross votes. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's designed for project. For project, but yes, projects can grow, and you, during the course of development, it could be seen. Actually, this is bigger, or I'm taking this in a different direction now than I'd originally intended, and that's fine. And so, and if that happens, like there's no, there's no, you know, that doesn't. Preclude. Reflect badly or anything no, like that, you know. No, yeah. no, and we're not like we're not expecting every project that will be supported for research and development to come back for a project. You know, there's no requirement, but it's just to enable people to take time to develop specific ideas, whereas the bursary tends to be broader and more by practice than project. It's just um sorry to go back to the same thing again, no like but um in relation to the restriction to applying only once yeah. to the bursary, type, yeah. it's only once even if you are unsuccessful yeah. and if you apply with a different project. Apparently, yeah. Okay. yeah. Great. It is. I have another question. Yeah. One of the requirements for one of the awards was that the work must be filmic. Yeah. I, I understand the experimental. Yeah. But filmic, filmic, is it a technical requirement? Is it? No. Made for, think in terms of cinema. It must be film. you know, it, yeah. Yeah, not television, you know, in the kind of, yes, you can see great television or, yeah, but like, it should be big, you know, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you've been shortlisted for bursaries previously, is there any benefit in mentioning that in a new no. application? No, 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 no. I don't think so. No, there isn't. Uh, and we would know anyway, yeah. um, the system. And then show. something I've heard, I don't know, is it a kind of a rumor or something? Is there a kind of a ladder you climb no. in a way, like agility no. to next gen? To, no, no. Um, some people pro possibly, yes, but there isn't. There isn't. I would say, though, like I said before, if it is your first time, go for agility. You know, or if you've been unsuccessful before, try, try with agility, and then because it is lighter touch, less competitive. It's as well. less competitive, money. yeah, um, and relatively more money, yeah, yeah. It's it's offered across every art form, and the budget is divided out across art forms. But the film ones will only be competing with the film ones. Actually, it's a kind of pause between two stools in a way. That one, yeah. But um, but a lot of people would, like, I'm saying there isn't a ladder because there isn't formally a ladder, but people might find as they, you know, that, yes, they do agility, then maybe a, a bursary and then a project. But, like, some people have got um, the first award as an authored works, actually, you know. So there's no, there are no hard and fast rules around it. You could do, I would, I really would, like, agility... As Audrey has said, it's it's not as competitive as other strands at all and or other rewards. And it is lighter touch. So the requirement of you isn't as big, but you do need to demonstrate a practice in the area of where the Arts Council fits in the film ecology. You know, you need to be an artist, uh, a film artist or working in the area of film. Can I just ask one question with the project award? If you are successful with strand one, does that enhance, like, does that strand, no, because the strand two? They're all on their own terms. They're all, every round we ever offer, you're only competing in the moment in that round. Yeah. It just means that you will have a project that is developed going in. So it'll be a strong, you'd imagine, you'd expect, yeah. we expect that those will be stronger, they'll have been more thought through. So yeah. that would, we expect to give it advan an advantage, but that, no, oh, no, yeah, there, no, no strict rules apply. Um, sorry, I just have a question for people who are coming from a more narrative yeah. field and are trying to make the move into mm. uh, doing more work in an experimental field. And for me, it would be my first time applying, so I would go for the Agility Award. Yeah. But do you have any advice on how you would 
demonstrate yeah. that you are a film artist. Yeah, go out and film a, stuff. So you do on your phone. Yeah. Okay. Or you know, um, yeah, you you need to be, or your collaborators or mentors or whatever, and that's exactly the type of question that you guys, I'm sure, would be able to if you sat down um, with you that you'd be able to give advice on as well. Like it's. And I want, before we finish up, I want to come back to how we assess awards. I think that might be useful if we've got a few minutes for that. But um, yeah, yeah, no, sure. If you um, don't achieve strand one, but then achieve it independently of the Arts Council. Yeah. Is it possible to apply for strand two? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the strand is, two okay. is independent. They're independent oh, all of independent. one another. That's yeah. That's right. Thank yeah. You. It's, we're, we've always had like strand two was until this year was just was the project award and we've just introduced a strand one um to enable really to enable people to um take time to develop projects so that's that's the idea of it the other thing i'd say is a lot of you know people would talk to us oh you know film i want to make work for a gallery if you want to make work for a gallery there is visual arts, you know, so we're not, it's not that we don't, the Arts Council doesn't support work for gallery contacts, of course we do, but you go through the visual arts stream for work of that nature. Um, often work we support might have a secondary life in other settings, including galleries, but in the first instance, we're looking at work, filmic work for cinema. Um, I just wondered how what your general reaction is to how the Agility Awards is working from your side and I'm conscious that it was something that was brought in as you say during Covid so is there plans for longevity of that or is it is there anything in the future that you can give us um, some insight into? I can only give you the here and now on it and um, it's a, an award that is seen to have worked across um, worked well across many if not all art forms it was probably more diff film it probably didn't work as well um as in other areas because a lot of people coming in for it when they saw it advertised thought it was for you know maybe more mainstream film practice and um it's not so we would have got had a lot of applications in the first few rounds and like more than 50 60 Seventy percent Russia were not funded. Like they were, they did, they had no, they didn't fit within the context of the Arts Council's role in remit and film, and that's um, what's required. It was because it's a generic award. Sometimes with the more generic awards, they can fit maybe performing arts better or, or whatever. But we've tried. I think it's working better now than it did at first. I would say. I think people have a greater and better understanding of it now. I can only speak for the here and now. Yeah. It's on offer this year, whether it'll be offered next year, I don't know. The film project will be offered next year, one round. The bursary, film bursary, film project, real art, authored works will be offered in 24. But the cross art form ones, other people are involved in those, so I can't make any. I would just like to back that up with our own anecdotal <laughs> that we have with artists and the how useful people have found the agility award and how like and how it did take a little bit of time to for people to figure out what it was what role it had how it fit with their own practice so i can definitely see that process of like of it improving over time we have found it to be an immensely useful uh form of funding in in the conversations with artists it comes up a lot um, and the feedback we get on it is often like that it's it really has a purpose but probably good to just have those conversations before you apply even at the level of like agility award yeah 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 um i have a question concerning dates mm -hmm. so um uh, when i i tried an application for the agility award myself and um there was a section where the activities, um, uh, you know, development of the practice and such was linked by from the, from this date to this date. And I thought that threw me off a little bit because it was and not that it was hard to decide how long it would have taken for the activities, but when to plan them uh, at the time of the application was a bit difficult. Um, also, not really, of course, knowing exactly when uh, the application would end or when the award would be given. So um, I found that a little difficult and I wouldn't want that to throw me off again uh, if I was to apply again. So I wonder if you have any advice on how to address that particular part of the application. 
I suppose the only advice I'd give around that, the Arts Council never funds things retrospectively. I think the only government until this week never funded anything retrospectively. Um, but we don't fund retrospectively. So make sure you allow enough time, push it out because agility can take it because we get so many applications for agility across the art form. Like visual arts would have hundreds and hundreds coming in. Um, so push it out in case we get a huge number, you know, we have to extend the period of assessment. I just on that, I wanted, if it's all right, before I come to you, just to say a bit about assessment. Um, when your um, applications come in, they are, they are assessed by um, our film advisor, Moretta Dillon, who's here, and um, then Moretta and I go through them. We agree a short list. We go through every application and agree um, a short list. The short list goes to panel, a peer panel. And it's the peer panel that decides. Now, there, there are slight differences with real art and authored works, but everything goes through an assessment process and to peer panel, except agility. Agility is just decided within the team. And that's why it's, it's when we say it's light touch, it doesn't have um, that added layer to it. The film ones, the specific film awards that we've talked about, they go to a film peer panel. If it's Next Generation or Markovich, it's a cross art form peer panel. That means a panel of four or five people, maybe from music or theatre, not necessarily film or, you know, you're not, it's not representative of every art form because a panel, it, it doesn't have to be, but it has artists, you know, so it's a general peer artist peer panel, just to say that. Okay, because I think that's important to reflect on in when you're thinking you know, of what award maybe to apply for. I just a very quick question. Is uh, this the last year for the Markovich Award then that it brings it up to well, 23? That's a, because that's a department award, that's my understanding, but I can't say we operate it on behalf of the department. It's not an Arts Council Award as such. So the department will make a call on that. But I would imagine so if it's decade of centenaries. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of um, project awards that might have been unsuccessful, um, if you feel that you kind of uh, have taken feedback and have kind of utilised it and so on, is it frowned upon or discouraged for people to then apply with a similar project, you know, again the next year, or if you do feel that you've kind of... A different changed? project. A, a different project. A okay. different project, yeah. 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 Unless you're told, unless it's very specific, you know, and that doesn't, I mean, I can think maybe of one or two instances over 15 years where that might have happened, maybe, you know, it's, it needs, yeah, yeah. So that's why make it the best you can be. Make it the best it can be. Just bear that, wait, wait another year, you know, um, or apply to the development strand first and get it to be the best it can be. That's why we've, we've put that in there. I wanted to ask you, um, would a film award or a any of these that you've listed, would that be suitable for a project where one wants to explore the, the medium of uh, cinematography? So all the um, like tools that cinematography utilizes, such as lighting, film stock cameras, lenses, like. Or does it, do, do these project awards focus on what's on screen rather than how it was filmed? I don't know if I'm Yeah, no, there, um, if I understand you correctly, um, yeah, this is about making films. The project award is about making a film. It's a production award. Yeah, but... But, but it can it's... explore. Look, we don't say what it can or cannot do, and people certainly have in the past, and I think one of them is in the room, um, done work in exploring um, film on film, if that's what you that's, mean. That's yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah I think like, certainly the reflexivity you're talking about, I think, is something that you see in arts. A lot of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if there was maybe another, uh, like, visual arts. Or... Now, I would say, you know, you need to look at the requirements of the, uh, you know, if you're in that space, look at 
film, the film project award and look at the visual arts award and see which suits you best for what you want to do. Yeah. Thanks. Um, is it fair to say that the round two of the bursary type projects is less competitive if people apply for the round one unsuccessful? It precludes people from applying for the round two, you know, of bursary type project or bursary type awards. Um, well, we only offer one bursary round a year in film. Oh, OK. Yeah. So there isn't a round two. Agility is, there are two in agility, but you can only apply for one of them. So if you're unsuccessful, you can't apply for the second round. Isn't that it? What you're saying is, do you have oh. a better chance in one round? Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I think the reason... Yeah, because they're yeah. independent of one another and competitive. The reason that might happen no, is if the budget is different in one round and there's more money to go around. But, you know, that's, it's not, yeah, it, it's really more of a level playing field in terms of just, it's the strength of your application. Yeah, every, every round of every award, the applicants are set in the competitive context. It's not us, it's the applicants, you know, it's the artists. And yeah, so it, you know, it changes. One year we might have a really, really strong authored works round or real art round or project round and another year we might not, you know. And I would really say as well, look, if you have Irish, look at Ildana. It's really good. Really interesting work has been made under it. Like for the first time, there's um, a documentary just um, in the last round was commissioned on architecture and the Venice Biennale, you know, it's in Irish. So it's worth looking at those and it's worth looking at the, if you're interested in a bursary and you're established, because it is for an, an artist of distinction, the film artist in residence at UCC, look at that. Don't just think of the ones that might spring immediately to mind, like project and bursary and agility, you know, do look at those other ones because they probably don't get the same number of applications. Also, I, I think one thing, I'm not, I'm not sure whether we said it or not, was just in relation to the film clips, the examples of your work oh, that yeah. you put in, just make them relevant to what you're talking about you're going to do in your proposal, um, just that they, you know, demonstrate that kind of film work rather than, you know, Something other you've stuff you've yeah. done, you know, if it's not relevant to what you're talking about in terms of what you're going to do in your proposal, it's, it's, yeah. It, yeah, it's it has to inform it, doesn't yeah. it? The, the clips you provide must inform what it is you want to do. And if that means going out with a camera and shooting stuff yourself, that's fine. You know, maybe don't give us three of those, but one or, you know, give us anything that shows us what you want to do. If you find like, uh, sizzle per se as an example like a little say 30 to 30 seconds minute example of what you intend to produce is it okay to submit that as well even though it hasn't been published or it hasn't been yeah. screened anywhere yeah okay. yeah but you probably would want to have a you know a few longer pieces a couple of longer pieces i think you're allowed three of up to 10 minutes so a couple of other ones in there as well but yeah absolutely that's what i mean show it show and tell and make, can I just make a plea? Plain English, just tell us what, like, this is about communicating your ideas. Just tell us in English, plain English, what it is you want to do. You've got to communicate to quite a number of people and we can't, um, we can't imagine what it is you want to say. You've got to tell us, so. Get that, somebody else to look at your yeah. application that doesn't know you know, about it to see. It's a really good idea. Yeah. Can you just explain the, the differences between agility and bursary? Complain differences. They're very, I mean, the agility, it can be, it can be a bursary, but it's up to 5,000. And the, um, the bursary is more than that. The requirements are more, the application's more detailed. Um, so you've to do less and for an agility award in terms of making an application and um, the bar isn't as high, but you could be applying for the same type of thing under an agility as a person. The, the outcomes could be the same. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's like a mini, in some ways in film, it's like a mini bursary or a mini, mini, mini project, or it can be either. Is that fair to say, Maratha? <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us again for this second half. Um, again, um, I'm Alice, this is Daniel, we're co-directors of Amy, and we're really thrilled to be um, in conversation with Tygo Sullivan uh, uh, today, and we're going to sort of have this sort of interview with him about his work with kind of a, a very specific focus on the role that like Arts Council funding um, and like mentorship and collaboration, the, the roles that those things have played in the development of his practice and career. And um, so I think it's a really nice kind of follow on from the conversation that we were having earlier and, and the presentation from Fanula and Audrey uh, from the Arts Council. So we're not going to spend too much time with a kind of bio of uh, for Tyke since we're kind of going to get straight into it. Um, and we're going to speak for, I think, just under an hour or something and leave time for questions at the end. Um, and we kind of thought what we would do actually is start um, in the here and now and talk about this kind of this current project and then from there go back to the beginning. So um, we're also going to be looking at some clips of Tyg's work. Um, and yeah, so I thought maybe we would just sort of start by asking about this new film and um, yeah, and kind of what are the, what kind of stage is it at and, and how is it funded and, um, yeah, how is it going at the moment with it? Um, all that. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for, for bringing me in. It's um, it's a privilege to, to be somebody whose work has been supported by the Arts Council um, over the last, I think it's about 14 years since I first got a project award. Um, and it's slightly embarrassing to see my name keep coming up there about <laughs> all, all of the different <laughs> strands that I've got. Um, it's something I'm very, very grateful for. Um, and yeah, it's, it's nice to be, it's nice to be here to talk about that and to, to, to share any insights that might be useful for people to, to, to benefit from. Um, to your question, um, the film in question is a feature film called The Waves, The Sea. Um, it's my first foray into drama as such. Um, it's not the most dramatic film ever made, um, but it's, uh, it's something that was funded through Authored Works, um, and it is a feature film about a woman who lives on her own by the sea who is prompted by a small loss to sit down and write a letter to an unknown correspondent. Um, and the woman in question is played by Brenda Fricker. Uh, and I shot it last this winter, like as in 12, 12 months ago, a little bit more. Um, it's pretty much finished bar the content of the letter, which is the voiceover that the film will have, um, which is nearly done. Um, it's, a, it's something that might come up as a kind of a thread through my work is that I tend to work a lot either with literature or with this kind of combination of the written slash spoken word and imagery. It's just a really rich thing to me um, in terms of combining the spoken word and the image, not in an illustrative way, um, but more in a way that each draws meaning out of the other. Uh, I think somebody made the point to me a very, very, very long time ago that the Book of Kells is not illustrated, it's illuminated. And that's a word that I always come back to in my head is just the illumination that different, uh, that text can bring to image and image can bring to picture to create something that's beyond each of them. Um, so I'm not, I haven't worn it out as a method yet. Um, I'm close to it as I stare at the draft of this script over and over and kind of regret ever taking it on. Um, but it's been a really enjoyable process. In terms of, just to say, I, I suppose I'm, I'm conscious of all the things that were spoken about before lunch and what might be useful for people to know. Um, is this an experimental film? Probably in the sense that I didn't know what it was going to be like when I set out. It's a drama that I got funded without a script, which if you were to talk to other people who make drama films in this country is an unheard of uh, privilege. Um, 
but it wasn't funded on the on the basis of nothing. It was funded on the basis of a pretty well thought out, I think, um, treatment, which was many, many, many pages long, had lots of images, um, and a very detailed kind of description of the mood and the atmosphere and the feeling of the film and the themes that it would explore. Um, so that created a kind of a roadmap, which I was then able to uh, experiment and um, and work with an actor, work with a crew, and just find the film that worked as I went. So it broadly looks like what I had in my head, um, but it not to the level of precision that uh, a scripted feature film might be expected to, if that makes sense. And it, it deviated from exactly what was on the page, but didn't just lose things, it gained things as well. Gained things on the day that we were shooting them, gained things in the edit, gain things as I write them. Um, and I think that freedom to kind of follow a path within a prescribed shape um, is, I suppose it's a bit like, you know, wandering into a new city um, and leaving your phone behind and having the confidence to find your way through that rather than saying, this is my exact route. Um, so, so that's kind of that. I'm going to show you 90 seconds or so of it. I chose a not the most exciting part because I'm really nervous about showing any of this. So it's just for the sake of showing you something. I said I'd show you this and you get to see Brenda. Sorry. It doesn't cut to that. It doesn't get... <laughs> no, that is experimental. Oh, I'm re I, uh, I, that's really made me think about it. I'm going back to the edit. Yeah. Um, so, like I say, I, I kept that super ambiguous because, yeah, it just it's 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 a nervous thing, like bringing something in to, to show people um, when it hasn't been seen by anybody. But, um, yeah, it's that's broadly the the shape and color of the of the film. Um, I suppose just to explain the where it came from, um, I, I was became very interested in lost and destroyed artworks and the question of why do we care when things are destroyed you know, art especially. And there's a whole political thing around why certain things are minded and kept and uh, archived and why other things are not. Um, and that's a, a very freighted cultural set of decisions. Um, and it just became something that I became very interested in. And so I thought maybe I'll make a film, a documentary about that, about lost and destroyed artworks and, and what we, why we care. Um, and it just stayed with me, and the more I thought about it, the more I became, or the less interested I became in a documentary that just explored this. Um, I was interested in maybe writing an essay that explored this, um, because that's something that I am very interested in, the literary, the literary form of the essay, and um, that could go from Venice to the Benin Bronzes to, you know, slave ships lost in the Atlantic. And then I thought, why does anybody care what Tiger Sullivan thinks about this stuff? Would it not be far more interesting to put these ideas into the fictional person's mind um, and let him or her think, write the essay in, way, in some way? And that's kind of where the film came from. Um, inevitably, then, you start thinking, who's the person? So an older person is far more interesting thinking about lost and destroyed things. There's a certain resonance with people who were in my life who would have I could kind of relate it to. Um, and then male or female, women are far more interesting. And then Brenda presented herself. So that's kind of the, a rapid kind of summary of how I got to there. Thanks for that. Um, I was just going to quickly just like, because I think we'll, we'll probably, yeah, I think we will come back to this project, but I just found it really interesting when you're talking about your kind of like work plan in relation to this and also how you described the project and maybe that not, like that, that, that like, the level to which these projects are experimental, but that also extends can extend to how you describe the project. As long as you describe the project clearly and are able to communicate that, that's the most important thing. And that it doesn't have to necessarily, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but like take the shape of like a standard uh, screenplay, a standard uh, standardized like uh, storyboard, you know, that it, that it, it can look differently as long as it communicates clearly what, what you want to do. Um, but I suppose just extending that like that like experiment to to the to the work plan is is interesting. But I think it it also like 
I think there's, what I was going to also ask about is like the degree to which like your, your practice has been collaborative and the possibility that like um, the kinds of collaboration you see in projects like funded, you know, in the way that we see through the Arts Council, for example, allow for kinds of like collaboration that maybe look a little different, maybe less hierarchical sometimes, I don't know, but look different to the kinds of um, um, collaboration can look different or the potential to look different. And I just wondered what maybe your experiences of collaboration have been in relation to that and maybe even like, you know, talking about the like beginning of your career a little bit and if that's... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think anybody who's seen anything that I've made uh, will be bar to the moon, which we'll come back to. Um, the credits tend to be quite short um, because I do a lot of the stuff myself. Um, but then I also work with a small few people. Um, and Fergal Ward is one of those. He's an old, old friend of mine. He and I kind of started making films together uh, a long time ago. Um, and, you know, going back to, again, something that was raised before lunch, um, we made a film together. Uh, I'd made a few things for Channel 4, smaller bits and bobs. Um, but then the first real thing that I made was with Fergal, and it was a documentary about a boxing club in Stony Batter, around the corner from where we lived. Um, and we just made it for the crack. Like, we just wanted to. We borrowed a, an old Sony mini DV camera. Fergal's an amazing photographer, cinematographer. He had that covered, so we needed somebody to do sound. Mogan's here, had to figure out which end was the business end of a microphone. And off we went. Like, I edited at the time, so I looked after the sound, I did the editing, and, you know, the film showed in Galway at the FLA. We were delighted with that. We had no idea how to distribute a film or anything, really, but we just wanted to figure it out, and we just... And looking back on it, like, there's some really nice, really nice stuff in it. Um, and it just allowed us to find our voices with nobody cared what we were doing, you know what I mean? It was nobody's business, and there's huge freedom in that. And so then, by the time I was applying to the Arts Council for funding to make the next film, I could trade off that. And I had a confidence, you know, to know that, going back to what we were saying, like, if, if you have a framework, you can experiment within that. If you don't have a framework, then you're just at sea and you're just running around with a camera. But, and I, and because there's always the question of how much, how prescriptive is too prescriptive or how prescriptive is not prescriptive enough. For me, it's about putting a framework, which can be a geographical one, which we'll come to, or, you know, the feeling of a film um, is really important to me. And I can pr I'm pretty good at articulating that now on paper, through images, through words, whatever else. And that becomes the framework within which you can then improvise an experiment. You know, and to go back to the word experiment, like I studied engineering a long time ago. Um, like an experiment, something is not an experiment if you know what the outcome is going to be, fundamentally. And if you're designing an actual experiment in a scientific arena, you have to set parameters. You're only varying one thing or a, set, a small set of things. Everything else is very tightly controlled. So when it came to making the, the first film that, I'm, that I got funded through the Arts Council, um, I wanted to make a film about the sort of the intersection of the built environment and people. You know, how does architecture and society kind of interact? Um, and so I, wanted, I decided to make a film about a particular street. You've got a set of parameters there. The film can only be shot on that street. Everything else is up for grabs. Like Lars von Trier's The Five Obstructions was a film that had a huge impact on me. Um, if anybody hasn't seen it, it's Lars von Trier tells Jorn Leth, uh, a famous Danish filmmaker, he has to remake a short film he had made 20 years previously called The Perfect Human. Um, and he had to remake it according to these random rules which von Trier then gives to Leth. He says, you have to make it in Bombay. You have to you do it in such a way that there's no shot longer than a second. And he makes these five versions of the film, each of one of which is amazing. But uh, there's huge power in that, in putting some kind of framework, and then all of your experimentation and freedom and creativity can go into that. So making a film about a single street, I felt at that early stage of my career was, if I couldn't do that, I told myself, then I wasn't going to bother. You know, I was in, I don't know what age I was, younger than I am now, but 
like, because part of me wanted to go off to Palestine and make a film, I wanted to go to Africa and make a film, and I just said, if you can't make a film on a street that's half a mile away from your house over a month with a budget, you're wasting your time. Um, so that's what I did. And I was lucky enough to get a, a project award. Um, I think it was 26 I got for that, which, again, working with Fergal, camera, sound, edit, that's it. And you can, you're just buying time after that. You know, you get yourself a decent camera, get yourself some new microphones, and just go. Um, and then edit for as long as it takes. And yeah, that was, I think that was the film, and we'll show a little clip of it now, that really helped me to establish things that have kind of stayed with me since. Like the disembodied voice, working out of sync. Like myself and Fergal, Fergal doesn't even have ears. He doesn't care what the sound... <laughs> He doesn't care what the sound guy is doing. He just goes, oh, I'd see a thing, and he'd film it. So I kind of had to adapt to that, and I just... And we didn't want to be running around like a kind of pantomime horse hooked up with a cable. So he just did his thing, I did my thing. We watched each other, and we kind of circled around each other. And what that meant in terms of creative style was that there's no... almost no sync sound in the film. Like, there were just... And I realized there's tremendous power in that. I don't care about sync sound. If I see a person, I don't need to choose the bit when he's saying the thing. I just really love a particular shot, as we'll see in the, in the bit we're going to play. Um, and that in itself was a huge freedom. Um, so you kind of start to find your way of working that works for you, and then that informs the, the kind of artistic practice. The two are totally linked. You know, the equipment, that kind of connection between equipment, technology, and what works for you on screen. You know, they are absolutely connected. So do you want to play it? Sure. <laughs> um, I found this such a powerful film to revisit, like when we were talking about what films we sort of discussed today. Mm -hmm. And it kind of struck me before I was watching it how, um, oh, this is going to be kind of an anomaly because I consider so much of your work with the new film uh, not not part of this, but there's being such like a strong archive mm -hmm. element to your practice. Uh, but when I kind of watched this, I thought, oh no, this is very much of a piece because this is this very kind of clear record of, um, you know, a, a, a space and, a, and the people within it at that time. And it, it, it has sort of transformed for me. Like I remember when I first saw it, it meant something quite different than it does now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very kind of emotional in that way. But um, I, it also made me think about the first time I saw it, which was in an experimental film club screening at the IFI, mm -hmm. programmed by Aoife Desmond. Mm -hmm. with, it was a program of street films mm -hmm. with like um, Helen Levitt and John Leota and mm -hmm. maybe one or two others. And I'm just curious about what that experience was like then, you know, um, following on from your first film, which screened at Galway Film Flab, but this whole kind of, um, experience of having your works curated in programs with other filmmakers from Ireland, international filmmakers, and like, what did that do in terms of, you know, your understanding of your own work, and mm -hmm. how did it sort of change ideas you might have had about audience, and sort of, yeah, what did what doors did it open for you in that way? Yeah, it's um, I suppose there's the the intensely local and the global in a way. Like this film didn't didn't travel as much as subsequent films but there was a little bit of a sense of that of, of what was possible um, and the sense of making work that could speak to other work and would be seen in a context um, and you're then watching other films that somebody has decided are akin to your film and you become part of a kind of an ecology of, of filmmaking which itself is very empowering and very exciting and it's also like I'd forgotten about that IFI screening um, it's also just really nice to be part of a broader scene, you know, and like it's something that struck me when Fanula was talking about the various things that the Arts Council fund. It's not just about funding us to make films and just send them out into the ether. The Arts Council is very good at facilitating a kind of an ecology and infrastructure of showing films. And it's really important that we all go to see those films and go and see each other's films and collaborate, you know, to your point. Uh, work on each other's films and support each other. You know, like I read a really interesting article in a UK London magazine about why Irish literature is doing so well at the moment. And the Arts Council gets a 
lot of ink in that article because it's about funding the bursaries that allow people to go off and write the, the, the essays and, and stories, but then also funding the stingy fly and the things that publish them. And you generate a kind of an ecology of that. And I think film has a little bit of that, to my mind, not enough. And I think we, we would do well, these guys are doing plenty. It's up to us to actually use, you know, to go to the screenings, to work on each other's films, to, to support each other. I think that's where, like, I was talking about Lars von Trier earlier, like Dogma 95 was a huge international cinema movement relatively, coming from a country the size of Ireland, Denmark, um, that totally broke new ground using technology um, and, and became a very important movement in cinema. I would love to see Ireland's film be as good as its literature. It is as good, but for it to be as renowned, you know, and maybe what's happening with Colin Kuhn now is going to precipitate something around that, I don't know. Um, but I'd love, the only way that will happen is through mutual support and creating, you know, go back to that word that was in the slide, an ecology of filmmaking. It's really, really important. And um, just to kind of follow on from that, and just to sort of like tie it back to like quite practical stuff, um, I was going to just maybe just been thinking about like audiences and thinking about like the kind of lifespan of a film and what it does. And like, you know, we talked about how that kind of how your experience with a film will lead into the experience with the next film. And just um, what the question I'm trying to kind of form around that is like, is if you could talk a little bit, bit about maybe in relation to a specific project, even your, your the stage at which in the planning process you start to think about okay, what is this film going to do? Where is this film going to go? And maybe even like your the kind of even ideal situations for that that you start to kind of think about when you're um, when you're trying to think what a film could do, um, and you know, and also maybe even sometimes when it didn't you know, you didn't quite make it to that, like, ideal, but, like, but just that, how that planning occurs in relation to a particular project, maybe even how that's shifted over time, is that... In terms of distribution and where it lands, yeah. ultimately... In, ter in terms of, like, what a film does after it's made yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and, like, where that ties into the film, the conceptual process and, like, and maybe how that's shifted over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think... Like what we were just saying about feeling part of some kind of a scene, and there can be the local. And what I was going to say there is that, like Fergal, the same friend who shot Bow Street, used to run a space in Stony Batter called the Joinery, which was a, a little DIY art space, which, which was brilliant. And we showed this film and other films of ours there. And so you had the intensely local around the corner from your house kind of network. But then over around the same time, I started going to international European festivals film that Fergal and I made our first feature film, which was funded through Screen Ireland, um, called Dixie Malou, did relatively well on the international documentary circuit. So we ended up in Marseille, in Wroclaw, in places like that, and meeting international filmmakers. Um, and so when it came to the next film that I wanted to do, I had, it's kind of a follow on from Bow Street, this kind of nexus of architecture and society is something that is deeply interesting to me. Architecture as a means of articulating power in relation to a society um, is just something that I find infinitely interesting. That led me to kind of researching walls, borders, systems of exclusion, bureaucracy, that kind of thing, all of which crystallized in an idea for a film called The Great Wall, um, which Screen Ireland turned down. Um, thinking it was a bit too strange. Um, so I f thought it might fit real art. Now, I thought it was a bit of a stretch, to be honest, and this is the time before authored works. So real art was the only feature length f funding award that was there. Um, but it, it being about architecture, I suppose, I had a conversation with you, I think, um, or somebody else uh, about whether it would fit, and it, and it did fit. Um, so that film was then made through real art. But going back to your question, this is a film that was about Europe. Um, it was a look at the migrant crisis that was kind of bubbling away 2013, 2014. But while a lot of those films are made for a kind of a, 
a certain type of audience that would already think a certain thing. I wanted to make a film that was about Europe for Europe. Like it wasn't about the migrants themselves, it was about European responsibility about around creating a kind of humanitarian catastrophe through systems of exclusion. And so I very much thought that the European documentary circuit, which then feeds into television, would absolutely be who I was making this for. Um, and how I wrote the film, how I framed the film, where I shot the film, 14 different countries, I think, um, was all with that in mind. This was me kind of working angrily. Like, I was really, really passionately invested in making an angry <clears throat> film about, about that situation. Um, and it was something that I really want, more than other work that I'd done, it was something I really wanted to be seen and really wanted to be seen in Europe. Um, and it pretty much worked out that way. Um, the film is still on Mubi now. Um, it screened in a couple of TV stations around Europe, um, Finland, I can't remember, um, and did pretty well on the festival circuit. And that was very gratifying. Um, uh, but I think thinking with that in mind very much helped me frame and uh, kind of drive the film forward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so really, I mean, what you're describing there is like having an experience with an existing film that did well in a way that maybe you couldn't have fully planned for, you, you know, and then being able to use the experiences with that film and the, maybe the doors that opened a little bit to really, from a much earlier stage with the next film in some ways, is really being, okay, bit more intentional in 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 being able to think earlier about the kind of audiences you wanted to reach the kind of networks you wanted to the film to show within um, I, I just think it's really kind of interesting to map those processes you know yeah and useful for people and um, Alice did you want to? yeah I was just going to add that what you were saying there also kind of highlights to me something that's in your practice that's so interesting in that inbuilt in your projects are kind of audiences, you know, that like Bow Street was, there's a ready-made community of people who that film is very much about and for. Mm -hmm. And What Remains, which is a film we haven't sort of discussed yet, but like is this deep engagement with the IFI film archive, um, you know, who, you know, there's so many kind of ways that people are connected to that. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise with To the Moon, you've involved such a kind of but you've kind of created communities in in the makings of these projects. Yeah. And I'm just really interested in that because it seems to me then your thinking of audience is sort of part of the conceptual work, you know, from the groundwork, basically. Yeah, this is a really helpful therapy session for me. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I've just understand. I to be honest, I hadn't really thought about that too much before. I did in relation to To the Moon. Um to the moon, in a weird way, like if you make a film about European borders and walls and, and barbed wire fences and migrant detention centres, um, like to go from that to making a film about the moon felt like a stretch. Like, how is this the same thing? Or how is this? And in a weird way, it is a bit of a stretch. But it's that it's what separates us versus what unites us. To the moon is the inverse of the Great Wall. The Great Wall is about systems of exclusion and keeping people apart. And psychically, on some level, I needed a break from that kind of space of thinking. And I wanted to invert that and look at what actually brings us together. And without getting too soppy about it, but the moon and moonlight is something that we share with every single human who's ever lived. Um, and there's something incredibly hopeful and powerful about that. So it's the same concern but inverted to an optimistic space. Does that make sense? Um, so play the whichever you like there. So um, I think it's just great to, to watch that clip and also to just tie it to, to the moon a little bit. Um, I was just going to ask in relation to that or, and also kind of re just reflect really quickly on the, like, the sort of narrative tools you use as a filmmaker a little bit and... Um, like I think what we can get a sense of just even in watching the clip is is um is the the narrative voice that we we can kind of hear there and 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 I think like if we look at 
what like the kind of funding that you've been able to access has enabled, I think, and why maybe we, someone like Screen Ireland maybe like it's not the there's an ambiguity in in that voice, and it's not doesn't feel like univocal, like it, it like it's and it, while it's, the works are deeply personal and deeply essayistic, like um, the there's an ambiguity to the to the voice and like and how it's centered, um, and and I think that's across your work and um, I suppose I was just going to kind of ask you about how that kind of operates a little bit and um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just in case people don't aren't familiar with this film, The Great Wall is framed around a Kafka short story which is called On the Building of the Great Wall of China which Kafka wrote in 1915 and it's kind of amusing on the, the, the paradoxes and um, complexities uh, on an imagined uh, building of the Great Wall of China and the narrator in Kafka's story is one of the builders of that wall in China 2,000 years previously. The short story was written in 1915 um, as a, a metaphor, as a, a kind of musing, I presume, on European, the collapse of European empires at that time. And what struck me in 2013 was that while a lot of the discourse around exclusion, migrants, and walls in Europe was this, oh, whoa, this has never happened before. This is a brand new territory. Here was Kafka writing in 1915 about a period 2,000 years previously, which I felt mapped onto the world that we lived in in a really interesting way that illuminated the world that we lived in in a really interesting way. Um, why did I use his words rather than mine. Kafka's a better writer than me. Um, why did I use a woman's voice? I wanted it to feel like the text. It wasn't, you know, it should feel like this is a text, not a played radio work adaptation. Do you know what I mean? And I wanted just this juxtaposition of the text and the image to create something in the mind of the viewer, who I imagine to be mostly white Europeans because the whole point of the film is that it turns, it asks, where have these walls come from? They've come out of the will of the people, ultimately, is what Kafka is saying. Um, they're not put from above by the powers that be. They actually come from a desire uh, within the populace. Um, so it, the film is very much made for, for that kind of an audience. Um, in terms of frames, just going back to what I was saying about Bow Street and that, once you have a text like the Kafka's text, which I used pretty much half of. Again, going back to what I was saying, you've got huge freedom to do whatever you like within that. Do you know? There's your film. You're, you're, you're making a film that responds to that. And what I did was I, I didn't record the voiceover. I went off, I read the story so many times I nearly knew it off by heart. And then I spent six months shooting. And then I assembled a film that broadly worked with music and imagery only. And then I brought the text in and I edited for another two months, making the two speak to each other and resonate with each other. Um, because otherwise you're just propping images on an excellent literary device. Um, so it's about creating, going back to what you're saying with the voice, the voice is the voice of combination for me. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the literal voice can come from anywhere. The pictures can come from anywhere. They can come from archive, as we'll see on, in the Moon film. But the voice, my voice, you wouldn't know from listening for the last half an hour, I don't like speaking <laughs> much. Um, I like creating meaning. I like suggesting meaning. I like suggesting meaning for an audience to intuit themselves. And that's where my voice is. I'm becoming a little bit more comfortable saying things out myself. Um, I was saying to Fanula earlier that I've randomly ended up making a little series of radio essays for Culture File on uh, Lyric FM of late, and it's just me and a blank sheet of paper, and I can do whatever I like broadly on the subject of not knowing. And I really, really enjoy it um, because it's the first time that I get, and with the new film, this is kind of where I'm going. It's like I'm well, I'm using a fictional character to kind of sock puppet my own ideas, but being able to actually just say stuff out yourself, I'd be quite shy about. Um, whereas I, what I'm more interested in is taking a set of ideas and combining ideas, images, sounds, music, literature, whatever, 
to create a meaning in the mind of the viewer. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier. The mind of the viewer is always on my mind. I'm just going to ask like one quick sort of just even follow up observation in relation to that. If we kind of look at um, traditional documentary practice, and I think it's, it's interesting to talk about it in relation to the film that we've just looked at, a film that did quite well at like in documentary circles, documentary festivals, played a lot in those contexts. And I think, I think documentary festivals in particular have begun to look elsewhere into artist film in terms of like how to kind of modernize documentary practice, not modernize, but how to expand documentary practice and to make it more interesting. And what we see in relation to like a work like this is like if this was a traditional documentary made about those subjects, you know, very like um, explicit subjects, a very explicit time and place, um, we'd pretty much know what the voice is doing in relation to the image at all times. There's very little ambiguity a lot of the time. You know, we, we know what the voice is doing in relation to the, the images. And, and that ambiguity here is also what lets that film, I think, be have a... It, it stops the film becoming dated very quickly. It's, it's a much more timeless film. It still continues to be a highly relevant film while capturing a very specific moment. And I think, I think breaking out of the like, traditions of documentary practice you know, and like, challenging those has been, it's been, it's been really interesting in your practice. And it's, it's, it's just interesting to see what's happening in those realms and the expanded sort of documentary form. Absolutely. I mean, I, I guess, you know, there are lots of ways of, of categorizing film. For me, it's the fundamental thing. And when I sit down to watch something of an evening, um, is there anything for the viewer to do here? Like, I, I'm interested in the aviation industry. It's just another thing. So I watched the, the Boeing film on Netflix the other night, and I turned it off because it, literally my brain could just take in all the stuff. I didn't have to do any thinking whatsoever, so I was just slipping into a coma. Um, like the films that I make, you're making it with somebody, which is an imagined viewer. And the films I want to watch, I want to be included in the making. Do you know what I mean? That, that really connects with what I was thinking, which is what are the kind of key influences or who have been the key influences for you in developing those kind of ideas about the kind of work you want to make and have you sort of sought them out or how have they come to you? I'm just sort of thinking for people here, when we have like artist support sessions with artists, we're always talking about what you mentioned earlier about the importance of engaging with a wilder, a wider, a wilder and a wider field of practice. But I'm just wondering for you who or what those have been, even if they're not necessarily filmmakers and how, how you sort of found them. Yeah, I mean, I probably spent more time reading than I did watching films when I was young, young. Um, and as I, like in my early 20s and that, a lot of Beckett, a lot of Kafka, um, kind of Virginia Woolf modernism, that kind of literature was really interesting to me um, because it was unpredictable. It wasn't going where I expected. And because it, I felt I, I, as a reader, had to be kept to keep up. I had to do work. You know, and so as you're exercising your brain almost in dialogue with the work. Um, and I think that probably stuck with me. Um, and in terms of the films that I like, there's always a little bit of that. There's like what you call ambiguity is, is just space for the viewer to think and bring something of themselves to the process. You know, and like filmmaking can be a very solitary process. You know, depending on whether or not you're working with a large crew or like me, oftentimes just working on your own or certainly editing on your own, um, you get a bit lonely. So you kind of, you do need to include the other humans who are the future viewers in your, in your work. Um, otherwise, things I think can tend to become a bit solipsistic and a little bit self-indulgent. And we've all seen works like that. And, and I wouldn't be interested in, in going down that road. You know? And so would your collaborators be in some way some of your kind of the inferences as you're making work like yeah. Pat and Pat Collins and Fergal Ward or, yeah. you know, other people that you come back to working with again and again, would they be, is that how you sort of see the, the role that they also play as well as like practically day to day getting the project made, but like yeah. the conversations that you're having as you're oh, working? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, just long conversations with people and they don't have to be about what light you're going to use or what, you know, way you're going to shoot it. It's about the feeling of something 
um, things that are, you know, reference points and just bouncing ideas off people. And when you find somebody that you can work with, it's great. Like, you know very, very quickly. Um, Brenda Fricker is somebody that the moment I met her, I thought this is somebody I can, I know why she's amazing. Like, I know why people think she's amazing. Um, and it's because she has a, an amazing imagination as to, as to how things might be done. She's very open, very unconventional, um, and will be excited by an unconventional idea because she's worked for a long time in a very conventional industry. Um, so when you go to her with something, she'll bring a lot back then. So, you, yeah, you kind of find people that, you, that just click, you know, and I think that's really, really important. Well, I'm eager that we just don't forget to, to have a look at and have a chance to see a clip of To the Moon before. Yeah, do you want to do that and open it up yeah. questions? Yeah, and then be, open it'd up be, questions. Yeah, because we were talking about the importance of the audience. And all. So... Probably at this stage, it'd be great to hear from anyone if anyone has any questions or observations. Just while people are thinking about their questions, just what's interesting about this film from in the context of, of today is that this film, To the Moon, was funded under Open Call, which, as Fanula explained, uh, is was a, a scheme for funding art of any medium. So I would have been, I didn't know it, but I was competing with theatre makers, circus makers, literary people. Um, and But the other strange thing about this, unusual thing about this, was that I was allowed in this instance to bring funding from elsewhere in addition. So this is my only film that was made with Screen Ireland and the Arts Council and Arte and Finnish television money. Um, and that was great to, to make something on the, on the scale of this. Um, needed this particular thing because I don't know if people know about the film, but it's made from archive, like sixty-five percent archive, six and thirty-five percent original, sixteen mil footage shot all over the world. It was an expensive film to make, um, but and it was kind of a huge undertaking. Um, but yeah, I was kind of happy to spend a couple of years doing it. Right, sorry, question. <laughs> Um, it's just a question on, I suppose, your personal process. Um, is there a phase at the end of like a film where you kind of give it to a few people for feedback? Um, and also, how do you know when a film is finished? Um, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, there are a couple of people that I would show work to. Um, you know. Names that you would have you would have heard already. Fergal Ward. Um, it, we watch each other's cuts of films all the time, um, and would have long conversations about what works, what doesn't. Um, to the moon, I showed to a German, well, a New Zealand friend of mine who lives in Berlin, and she gave some brilliant notes on it. She knew nothing about it going in, and was just able to tell me things that I just wanted a totally blank, like a totally blind view. If or I can't think of the term, but. Um, she just said what she got and what she didn't get. Things that were really obvious to me. The film is structured around lunar phases. I thought it was really obvious, and she did not get it. So the, what you see at the beginning there, where I put the little graphics indicating the lunar phase, fix that. But without her feedback, if I just put it out into the world going, there you go, there's your film, nobody would have seen that, which was really surprising to me, being so close to it. But that's why you need things like that. So there are, yeah, there are absolutely certain people that not just at the end, but you talk to along the way, you know, and just even at the, at when you're making a funding application, I'm not just asking people to read something to spot the grammatical errors. I want them to know, A, can you see the film I'm proposing? B, do you like it? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Do you want to see the film? <laughs> As importantly, um, because you can write all you like um, about what you'd like to do, but if people can't see the film off the page. And, and again, going back to something that Fanula was saying about using plain English, when, when you read a treatment, and I do this myself because you know, I've been on panels and I've helped people you know, down the years, I don't want a Deleuze and Guattari kind of Lacanian analysis of your film. I want to know what's going to happen. 
yeah, that are, are, are better for never. <laughs> um, like, I just want to, and so when I'm writing them, that's what I want people to tell me, that, yeah, I can see this, and I'd like to see the film. That once, if you can get to that, then I, I'm, I don't mind if it gets funded or not, because that's what I want to do. But if, if you're falling at that stage, then, you know, you're, you're hobbling yourself. Do you know what I mean? So it's a process all the way along of opening it up to other people. Because cinema is about people. You know, it's about a room full of people watching it and feeling the thing that you felt when you were making it. That's what cinema is to me. Um, and that process starts with the page. It starts with the thing that you give to your cinematographer. It starts with the thing that you give to your would-be funder. It starts with, you know, the conversation you have with your partner about what you want to do next. It's all about communication, do you know? So, hope that helps. Um, maybe just pick it up on the process question again, just um, just in terms of your relationship to film and video as mediums, you know, um, what, what, how do you think about, you know, in terms of what, what do you use for a particular project, you know, um, obviously you use a lot of archive as well, but um, just because you straddle both film and video, I kind of was curious to how you, what's your process in relation to that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think... Uh, how do I explain this? Um, if you pick up a novel, it's either written in the first person or somebody who studied English can tell me what it's called when you can get inside somebody's head, but it's not free and direct speech, um, where you can you can un, you can know what the character is thinking. You know, so there's a there's a frame, and in literature, it's it's a really well understood thing. You know, are, is this book written from this point of view, from this point of view, from a god's point of view, whatever? We don't talk about that in relation to cinema. But I try to, like, and I will say, who is the camera? You know, who, when I'm, the film that I'm finishing now, you know, it's one woman on her own. Who is the camera? Can the camera be in the same room as the woman? Is it only ever in the same room as the woman? Is it, can they see, you know, and somebody says, oh, you need a drone shot. What, who is the camera that the camera can fly? You know, so, and, and when, if you can answer these questions, if you can say that the camera is a younger version of her that hangs out with her and is, is, you know, knows the space as intimately as she does, then you want a camera that's handheld, maybe, because that's going to reflect this kind of human view of the world. You want lenses that, you know, 35 to 50 mil, because that's how human eyes see. Um, if, it's, if it's a God's eye view, then maybe you do need to shoot it on a drone. You know, so, and from that comes the answer. You know, so you, will shoot, you might shoot it on film, handheld, because film looks really, really great handheld. Um, or you might shoot it on the smallest camera that you can, because you need to move the camera all the time. The Great Wall is shot anamorphically, super wide, because the subject is super wide. But the, the who is the camera conversation led to a discussion of this kind of omnipresent, omniscient narrator who somehow knows everything, um, but isn't God. So there's, the camera movement is, is central to the film. The, the camera can move because the people cannot. Um, so then you're choosing a camera that can go on a gimbal. So we shot on a Blackmagic Pocket, the original one, the 720p one, um, because it's tiny, it's beautiful, and it can go on a movie rig. So for me, the, the answer to your question always comes out of the film and a series of questions that you ask yourself to a point where the answer should be, almost be obvious. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Because I like people get hung up on film, film, and sixteen millimeter film, and God, I love it. Um, but you know, it's like somebody said about collecting records. I was first drawn to vinyl by the inconvenience and the expense. Like, <laughs> why? Why would you do that to yourself unless it has to be for something? You know, and what film will give you? And the reason I shot the bits I shot for To the Moon on film is that it needs to speak to the archive and not feel like we're making a comment by saying the archive is the past and the shiny new stuff is the present. I needed to collapse that time thing. So 16 millimeter had to be the answer. So like I say, everything comes out of interrogating the project and you'll arrive at the right answer. Um, I really like To the Moon. I've seen it a few times, but uh, I was curious about the role of uh, collaboration with regard to uh, the music in the film? 
was it Amanda Ferry and Irene Buckley? Um, I was just wondering if, like, in what way did that work? Was that, like, something that came, and you spoke really nicely about the relationship between the um, literary aspect, the text mm. part, and then the imagery, but then also the music, did that come in at, like, a, a later point after those things were finalised, or was that part of informing that? Um, I tend to... So in, in To the Moon, the music is, I would say, probably 65% existing licensed music and 35% Linda Buckley, rather than Irene, and Amanda Feary. Um, and yeah, look, the, there were bits, I find it very, very, very hard to work with musicians because they seem to exist on a level of artistry that is, makes a cod of what I can do. And you end up just going to make it more... Um, and I don't have the words. So I've, I actually have failed. You know, it's the one space where I've failed badly with collaborative pra uh, practice before because I, I don't have the language for it. But in that particular case, it was just about sharing poems, sharing bits, images. I always edit with the, f the music that stays all the way through. I can't edit with temporary music and then replace it with the good stuff. It just doesn't work for me because it's all part of it. Like, no, not one, one is not subordinate to the other. They're just as important as each other. Like, if you've text and image and music and sound, all four of those are part of the weave, um, and you can't just leave one to be added later. So it has to be right from the start, and that is a bit of a barrier if you're working with a composer, because, you know, it's a paradox. You know, you have to... So it can be hard. Um, but in that case... I think, yeah, just by, especially with, with Linda, it was just about showing her images. And we, are, we, we I showed her a particular poem, which is the um, Cailoc Beira, an old Irish poem, which she then t turned into music, essentially, and got, we got somebody to sing it. So that was very much a collaborative. I'm not sure who had that idea, but it was just something that grew out of the conversations. Um, this is going to be a real quick and well, not maybe not simple one, but um, where do you think inspiration comes from? Um, I think there's a couple of things. There's a desire to just make work, which is just in people. I think um, just an artistic drive, and that's just something that I would have um, in terms of. So you're going to be making something, you know, whatever that might be. Um, the specific things that turn into films for me, um, it's pretty much one idea wrung, <laughs> wrung out over 20 years. And, and like, because you can just, it's, or it's a small set of ideas that I kind of endlessly interrogate, um, which are just to do with, I don't know what they are exactly, um, but you just have certain, certain things that capture your imagination and speak to you. You know, like one thing that runs through it is, to, is, the set, is the power and the exclusion of people or the inclusion of people and what brings people together and what keeps people apart. You know, that's a fairly fundamental thing that's run through an awful lot of my films. And I just, I'm always looking for different ways to look at that same thing. Um, and then there are one or two other things. And so, yeah, it's just being open to something sparking off some uh, small idea that then can expand into that space of your the things that fascinate you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hopefully. Um, is there anything to do with specifically with just different strands of funding? Anything that connect that you, people might connect what I've been saying with what Fanula was saying earlier that might prompt a question. That uh, do you know what I mean? Rather than specifically to do with me and what what I do. Uh, the funding is described as facilitating proje projects that are non-narrative, um, to create a distinction between the stuff that's facilitated here and maybe with Screen Ireland and stuff like that. And yet, to me, it, there is narratives, very evident narratives in the stuff you do in a really powerful way. So, just in navig navigating that kind of how to judge that your project is the right side of the line in the sand. If there is a line in the sand, what advice could you give on that front? Um, I think experimental, experimental non-narrative is almost one sentence, and Fanula can 
correct me if I'm wrong where I'm going with this, but I'm glad that you say that there is a narrative. To me, narrative can be all sorts of things, but I tend to find that the narrative crystallizes in the process of making the film so that it ends up in a narrative place or and in retrospect it looks like it has that but that's something that comes out of the process as against something which is i want to tell the story of blah 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 blah, blah do you know um and i think that's the crucial thing with you know to me there are two types of funding um there's the kind of funding that is available to you if you know exactly what you're going to do and there are a lot of funders out there, Screen Ireland are one of them, but there are many, um, who want to know how many days you're going to shoot. Have you got insurance for day 19 when you have the drone? Um, what is, and everybody gets a call sheet every day, and it's, it's by the book, you know? And it's, it's an amazing system when you see it working. Like when you, if you walk onto a feature film set and there's 100 people, everybody knows what they're doing. They know that what they're doing at quarter past two that day. It's a phenomenal thing but it can only work if the writing of the film is watertight and everybody has planned everything to the letter. And that can make great films. You know, great films can come out of that process, but the work I need to make uh, doesn't fit that. So I need to work in a more loose way where if it's raining that morning, I just go, do you know what, scrap that. We'll, I just had this idea and everybody goes with me um, and that's okay. And there's no section for it, one person going, but you said you'd do three indoor scenes this week. Um, and, you know, it's a kind of an accountant's first approach to filmmaking. Um, so, yeah, it ends up, like I say, uh, forming a shape which you might term narrative, but how you get there is the important thing. And I suppose it also comes to, like, designing a filmmaking process around... around that and around what you find interesting within that. So, like, you know, have there been other things that you go, you know, that that wouldn't fit my, the freedoms I want in, in how I work and, you know, or that is down the road somewhere for something else, you know? And do you, like, have those sort of internal conversations a little bit with yourself? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I daydream about finding an amazing book and going, yeah, this is the film I want to make, but I haven't found it, you know? Um, because it's exhausting uh, sort of working this way. You know, I can really see the attraction. When I was shooting the new film, like I had to persuade everybody, you know, because we had 14 days of shooting and the first AD was like, okay, I'm just working on the schedule and then can we break down the scenes? And I was like, not gonna work that way. And to try and bring people on that journey is, can be kind of hard. It, it must be really, really nice to have a schedule and a map and we're finished on Thursday week. Um, but it just doesn't work for me. But I'd love to, I mean, I'd love to, to make a, a feature drama at some point. Um, but I have a funny feeling it might drive me mad. And I'm not sure that I'd be good at it. And that's the most important thing. I wouldn't take, sign up to some big project and have everybody standing around mm -hmm. going, what are we doing today, Tyke? I'd be terrified by that, yes. you know? And, and then and I'd really let them down and that'd be terrible. So please don't give me loads of money to make sure. <laughs> okay, um, thanks, Tyke. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, we'll probably bring it to a close. Um, yeah, it's been really helpful and really insightful. I think to to have these two um, these two things sit side by side. You know, just to be able to look at the nuts and bolts of what kind of funding is available and just go through that, and then to talk about like the creative process and and how that funding process um, fits in with people's actual practices is really really helpful. Um, was there other stuff, Alice, that you wanted to? Thanks again so much to Taig and to Fanula and Audrey and Steffi and thank you so much for coming and participating so generously as well. Hope to see you again. Thank you.